Previously on Administrative Law, we looked at the expansive interpretation of the concise general statement required to be included in a final rule promulgated under APA Section 553. Now we turn to a D.C. Circuit case, HBO v. FCC, which deals with the limits of permissible agency behavior during the comment period, that is, the period between the posting of a notice of proposed rulemaking and sometime prior to the publication of a final rule, when the court says the rulemaking record should have been closed. The rulemaking had to do with what was then called pay TV, which had recently arisen to compete with on-air broadcast TV. The FCC was concerned about the possibility that pay TV would siphon off desirable programming from free broadcast network affiliates with the result that wealthier people would get to see more and better programming than the community at large. But for us, the issue is not the final rule, but the legality of the agency procedure in promulgating the rule, in particular the issue of ex parte contacts between private parties and agency officials. Ex parte meaning without all present. A panel of the D.C. Circuit worried that allowing interested parties to ex parte FCC officials during and even after the official close of the comment period would impair judicial review. Overton Park requires that judicial review be based on the whole record before the agency at the time it enacts a final rule. But as a former FCC commissioner argued, if ex parte contacts are tolerated, there will be one record for the public and another record known only to the agency. Therefore, the argument goes, ex parte contacts should be avoided once the notice of proposed rulemaking is published, and if they occur, their occurrence, if not their content, should be listed in the whole record. The way to understand what the HBO versus FCC panel is attempting to promote is to look again at the procedural requirements set out in the APA. Section 553 rulemaking says nothing about ex parte contact. Sections 556, 557 do. Section 553 rulemaking says nothing about confining the record so as to exclude ex parte communications that happen to occur anyway. Sections 556 and 557 do. In essence, the HBO versus FCC panel is imposing certain 556-557 elements on Section 553 rulemaking, thereby creating what we could call a judicial hybrid rulemaking process. The HBO versus FCC panel wasn't acting out of a clear blue sky. It analogized to a circuit precedent the Sangamon Valley case. Sangamon Valley was a rulemaking that would reassign a more powerful VHF TV frequency to a more lucrative market. Although it was a rulemaking, the court considered its special character. In effect, because of its narrow and specific context, the rulemaking amounted almost to a licensing, in that it involved competing private claims to a valuable privilege. The Sangamon Valley Court therefore disapproved ex parte contacts between interested parties and FCC officials, just as though in a licensing proceeding. The court in HBO versus FCC realized that ex parte communications during rulemakings were a commonplace. In fact, they are the bread and butter of everyday business in Washington. And so the court merely ordered an evidentiary hearing to see what all had been going on down there in the swamp. Shortly thereafter, a different panel of the D.C. Circuit refused to discourage ex partes in a similar rulemaking proceeding, and subsequent decisions in the D.C. Circuit and other circuits hold that ex parte contacts are never forbidden in rulemaking, absent a statute. The Sangamon Valley Doctrine, however, may have survived. Another case raising the ex parte contacts issue is Sierra Club versus Castle. 
This was a high-stakes rulemaking that had political implications back home. The EPA rule would affect the relative affordability of coal mined in different regions of the country. The question was how much scrubbing to require of coal-fired installations. Scrubbers are costly, but the technology evolves. It was evolving even as the rulemaking progressed. Coal will never be clean, but it can be made cleaner. The question for the EPA was, by how much? How clean coal is when it comes out of or off of the ground depends on where it comes from. Eastern coal starts out dirtier than western coal. So in the middle of the country, meeting emissions goals will be easier by buying western coal. Unless, that is, all coal has to be scrubbed to a high degree in which case eastern coal might end up being just as clean and for many utilities cheaper to haul in. It all comes down to the details of the final rule. Senator Byrd of West Virginia would like to have a word in confidence with the EPA, but so would every senator and representative from out west. In Sierra Club versus Castle, we are confronted with some notions we do not find spelled out in the APA. For example, as in HBO, we encounter the idea of a closed comment period. The challengers object to late filed comments, and the DC Circuit opines that most likely the drafters of the Clean Air Act amendments of 1977 envisioned promulgation of a rule soon after the close of the public comment period. What we have in this case is an instance of a statutory hybrid rulemaking procedure. Statutory hybrids can come in any form Congress desires. Let's focus on what the discussion of a comment period tells us about the bare bones requirements of APA Section 553. We know the main elements of notice and comment rulemaking, but what does Section 553 say about timing? After notice, the agency shall give interested parties an opportunity to participate in the rulemaking through the submission of written data, views, or arguments. After notice, for how long must a comment period be open? Obviously, once a final rule has been published, the comment period is effectively closed. But what about prior to that? After consideration of the relevant material presented, the agency shall incorporate in the rules adopted a concise general statement of their basis and purpose. After consideration. After, but for how long? For as long as the agency likes? Ten days? Ten years? The APA is silent. President Clinton tried to clarify this in an executive order, stating that the comment period should be at least 60 days normally but the order says nothing about when a comment period should close. Let's try to visualize this on a timeline. We can agree that the comment period begins with the publication of the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking in the Federal Register. We can agree that the comment period ends when a final rule is published. We know that the effective date of a final rule is no earlier than 30 days following its publication. We know that President Clinton's executive order encourages a minimum 60 days for comments, but the APA says nothing about an end to the comment period. An agency might impose one on its own, or Congress by statute might impose an end to the comment period. That introduces the problem the court faced in Sierra Club versus Castle. Comments come in. Somebody is going to have filed the last minute comment. Assume that the universal practice among agencies as is required under some agency statutes, to make comments publicly accessible in a rulemaking docket or some other open repository. 
and some member of the interested public is going to want to rebut that last comment. Should the agency ignore it, no matter how cogent it might be? Or would it be arbitrary or capricious to ignore it? The problem of what to do about late filed comments does not arise unless a statute or an agency procedural rule closes the comment period. That we still have the question, does some commentator get to have the last word? Or must the agency delay publishing a final rule until every commentator has had a chance to comment on every other comment and comment on the comments? Justice Scalia has this to say about a related issue. Rulemaking proceedings would never end if an agency's response to comments must always be made the subject of additional comments. The comment period does not have to be reopened to allow comments on the final rule and its concise general statement. The response, of the, moreover, may take the form of new scientific studies without entailing the procedural consequence that a new round of comments be initiated unless prejudice is shown. The agency may even rely on data and studies that emerge for the first time during the comment period that no interested party had an opportunity to comment on. Unless prejudice is shown, Justice Scalia shrewdly adds, without suggesting what a showing of prejudice would entail. If there were a closed comment period, then prejudice could be shown if the agency relied on a late filed comment. But absent any closure of the comment period, other than by the publication of a final rule, it is hard to imagine what prejudice would consist of. Here, let us allow Justice Scalia to have the last word.